Good evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, the director of Griffith University's Islamic Research Unit, Imam Muhammad Abdullah. Singer-songwriter Deborah Conway, whose latest recording draws on stories of the Old Testament and her Jewish heritage. Atheist, comedian and star of Please Like Me, Josh Thomas. The Catholic Archbishop of Brisbane, Mark Coleridge. And an Australian raised Catholic whose spiritual journey led her to Tibet and to Buddhism, the Venerable Rabina Corton. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Q&A is live from 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time and you can join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag that just jumped up on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Lynn Simiana. Yes, my question is for Josh. Oh. Josh, we all acknowledge that uh, for every building there's an architect and for every painting there's an artist and for every book there's an author. How do you reconcile this with your belief as a, an atheist that our beautiful planet with its marvels and its uh, diversity um, has no creator? Uh, well, there's a fairly classic atheist response to this, which is um, if you create something, if you, if you think something can't just appear, uh, then it must have a creator. That creator has to be more complicated than the thing that was built. So. Uh, it's not a very satisfying conclusion for me to say that, oh, the world's beautiful, so there must be a god, because it can't just appear, because then the next question is, well, why are you comfortable with a god just appearing out of nowhere? Why don't you think he needs a creator? If you think he's more impressive than the world, which he presumably would be. Let's go, let's hear um, from a Buddhist perspective on this. Mm. Rabina Corton, is there a creation story in Buddhism? Uh, basically, Buddha says we create ourselves, that all our minds are beginningless and endless, and every action we do leaves an imprint in the mind that produces our experiences. So he says an external creator is an unnecessary embellishment. He doesn't say one doesn't exist, though, does he? He just refuses no, to talk he would, about it. No, he would say that's a, he would say that's a misconception really, about a superior... Yeah, he, well, if you like to say that, be controversial. <laughs> but, it's, but the Buddha would suggest that we need to discuss these things and there's nothing secret and hidden and we need to comprehend it and understand it. And so the position, I would say that I'm taking Buddha's view of the universe as my working hypothesis and I'm happy to find Buddha wrong. That's okay. Mark Coleridge. Well, I'm not happy to find Buddha wrong, but I'm happy to find the Bible right in my own view. <laughs> I, I, the Bible certainly posits a creator and an uncreated creator. So your point, Josh, about who created God, yeah. in a sense, isn't a question that the Bible asks at all. And it's not a question that's on my radar screen either, yeah. I have to say. Uh, so, uh, but, but the God who creates in the Bible is a God who brings something out of nothing. It's the only thing he's good at, is bringing something out of nothing, doing what seems to be the impossible. So, uh, so it's un and, and what the Bible would also say is that uh, I can't create myself. In other words, I'm led to that point of impotence where I say, I just can't do it. But at that point, you've got a God who says, well, I'll do it for you. OK, but uh, were humans <clears throat> created, in your version of this, were humans created by evolution? Did they spring from apes? I haven't got the slightest problem with evolution. In fact, uh, I think it's a great idea. Thank God for Darwin. <laughs> in other words, the, bib the biblical account doesn't uh, presume that, that the Bible is talking science. The Bible doesn't talk science. I it's science, to call it that, has been shot to pieces long ago. What the Bible talks about is, is not what happened, but what it means and what its purpose is. It's a different kind of truth. So as, uh, to reconcile the biblical account and, and evolution, I haven't got the slightest problem with that. Let's Even go, with the Big Bang Theory. All right, let's get an uh, Islamic uh, position on this. Um, first of all, creation. What's the Islamic version of how it began? It began with a creator. And uh, once we limit our understanding of a creator and give him human limitations, it becomes almost difficult to comprehend that such a limited God could create a magnificent cosmos and universe as we know it today. And that is why the, uh, the Islamic concept of God, monotheism, if you like, is very emphatic. In fact, almost one third of the Quran or the holy text of Islam is about the oneness of God, who God is and who God isn't. And it says that he is the absolute creator of the universe. God is known through ab attributes in Islam. And two of the attributes that are relevant to the discussion, one is al-khaliq, which is the creator. But that in itself may not, answer, may not answer the question that 
Did he create the universe or didn't he? So the creator, we can be creators ourselves. We can make things and call ourselves creators. But to do that, we need to have, we need to have raw material. We need to have something to create something. But another attribute that the well, Quran... Me, can I just, I'll just interrupt you there. Um, and t the same question yeah. really that I asked to Mark Coleridge. Uh, does, does your God create humans fully formed? Or does Islam accept evolution, that man evolved from apes? The Islamic worldview is that God created Adam and Eve. And he created humans as we know them. The Islamic understanding... So, so no, no evolution? Or? Evolution within species, not from species. So Islam mm. accepts the idea that evolution from within species, we adapt, we reform, we evolve in various ways, but not from a totally different species to a wonderfully amazing, perfect human being. Yeah, the other thing, could I, if I could just chip in here and say that for the Bible, not only does God create, but God calls the human being to be a co-creator. So it's not as if uh, the standard account of why God created the human being was to be a slave, to do all the dirty jobs. But in fact, what the Bible does is put a bomb under that conventional understanding, as the Bible so often does, and says, no, God created us to be co-creators so, with him. So uh, is it OK <coughs> for man to create life uh, if we reach that sort of medical... It, it uh, depends how we do technology it. ...technology to do that. We can do all kinds of things, but, but there is a point beyond which we cannot go. But yeah, God wants the human being to, to, to cooperate in the ongoing work of, of creation in all kinds of ways. And, and human creativity is a fantastic You draw thing. the line under cloning, I dare say. I would. Okay. Deborah Conway. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Lynn, because, uh, you know, there's so much beautiful poetry in, in the world and uh, in the Bible as well. Uh, the, the Jews would say that God is unknowable, uh, that there is, there is nothing that, that any human being could actually know about a creator uh, that can create everything. I, 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 I would say the same thing, God is unknowable, but I, but I can't subscribe to that myself. I, I think that science is also incredibly beautiful. There's so much poetry in the way that we, uh, we perceive the world to have started from a big bang, from um, tiny little organisms that the, they have sprung into fish and birds and, and, and mammals and, uh, and eventually uh, human beings. I mean, I, I, I personally, I think there's, there's so much extraordinariness in, in the world around us um, within the field of science that you don't necessarily need uh, to explain it in, 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 this, in the creator sense, in the, in the one uh, God putting everything together. Yeah. Having said that, Deborah, it's gonna, a I'm very gonna, comforting I'm gonna, I'm gonna, idea. I'm going to interrupt you because I've got a tweet that's just come in for you, uh, for Deborah from uh, Lauren Ingram. How can you be a Jewish atheist? Oh, that's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really easy question. Uh, you can, well, I'm Jewish because my mother was Jewish. My mother was Jewish because her mother was Jewish and so on and so forth. Uh, you can convert to Judaism. It's not a proselytizing religion and it's really hard work if you do want to convert to Judaism. It involves a lot of many, many years of study and probably a small circumcision along the way if you happen to be of the opposite <laughs> sex. Uh, but uh, but uh, you can, you can um, embody all of those things about being Jewish and be raised in a secular Jewish household that observes, you know, as I did in my household, um, Friday night dinner, Shabbos, we um, had seders at Passover, Pesach. We, uh, I, I fast on Yom Kippur and, you know, observe Rosh Hashanah and, and all of those other things. But I don't know, I'm just, I just can't quite go the extra mile and say, um, you know, and all of this is about God. But, you know, I love, I love so much about what it is to be Jewish. I love all the songs. I love the humour. I love the food. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, but it, I, I, I'm, I'm going to move, move us on into the realms okay. of uh, higher theology now. Uh, we've got a question from Hugh Cameron. I have two questions <clears throat> on the panel generally. What actually happens in heaven day by day? And <laughs> should there be such a place, can you be expelled from heaven? Mark Coleridge. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Uh, what go well, first of all, there's no time in heaven. We're caught up in eternity now. Isn't that tough? 
Mm. Uh, what happens, I, I imagine heaven, and heaven's hard to imagine, hell's far easier. You've only got to read Milton to see that. Uh, I imagine it is, it's, it's perfectly knowing not only God, but everyone who's ever existed and knowing mm. them in a way that is perfect love. Now, if you, if you love one person in life, it's enough to, to, to galvanise a whole life. But, but to, to, to perfectly love and be loved by everyone who's ever existed, I mean, who wouldn't want that? That, that's as I imagine heaven. Can you be... So, do you have a personality um, in heaven, do you suppose? Or what's the current church yeah, I, teaching I th- on whether you retain your personality? The church doesn't have a teaching on personality in heaven, you might be surprised to learn. Mm. But I think, yes, we, we remain the person that we are, even with a body in some sense. I mean, that sounds weird, doesn't it? But Jesus, when he rises from the dead, has a body. He's not just a spirit. So there's some kind of bodily reality. Don't ask me what it is. I don't know. So, so just a quick question, yeah. then, because the other part of that was can you be expelled? Yeah. And, uh, then... and the other quick answer to that is no, you can't be, because once you're perfectly in love, <clears throat> in love there's no desire to leave and there's no way of being booted out. But if out. you retain your personality, you would retain, for example, impure thoughts. No, you don't. You've got beyond all of that. Even oh. the Buddha <laughs> teaches you that, Tony. <laughs> no <laughs> impure thoughts in heaven. Let's find out. <laughs> Does everybody get to drive a really great car? In you can, Deborah, if yeah. you want. Okay. Just... <laughs> I don't know whether you've just rewritten theology there no, or no, well, I'm just creating a very large this, car dealership. This... <laughs> I just think heaven's Because there's no traffic jams no, out there. there. No. Yeah. Um, let's hear the Buddha. Is there, a, there isn't a Buddhist version of heaven, is there? Because it doesn't Listen, exist. Listen, Buddhist has got, I mean, from the big picture point of view, Buddhist have an amazing worldview, but I'm kind of bored talking about it. I'd rather talk about down to earth and be and find the common ground between it all. I just find it like yeah, but the, the, qu- the question has been asked: Is there a Buddhist? Is there a Buddhist heaven? Buddha asserts a whole many realms of existence, and they're all mental states created by those beings. Is Nirvana? Nirvana is a, a word. state of enlightenment. Is that mm. is that also a kind of heaven? No, no, no. It's it's like what he said. The state of being of going beyond. Buddha would say that all the delusions and neuroses in our mind are adventitious, which means they're not at the core of our being. And so the job of being a Buddhist is working on yourself day by day, perfecting your consciousness. I mean, I think it's a bit of a shocking state. If you go to a therapist and ask them to get rid of all ego and all neurosis and all anger and all jealousy, they'd be quite shocked. But this is what Buddha's asserting. And so the, statement, the, the achievement of your nirvana is that, that, the achievement of your own perfection which is, can be in this human body. It can Muhammad, be any time. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Well, Muhammad, is there, a, 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 well, is there an Islamic, a fully fleshed Islamic version of heaven? Absolutely. I mean, the idea that heaven exists, it's part of Islamic worldview. But I think a more important question is, if there is a heaven and it's something to do with metaphysics, it's the unseen, how would we know about it? And that links to the question of a creator. If there is a creator, and we believe there is, and he has created heaven, then he, should he not tell us what heaven is like? Otherwise, we'll be making our minds about what heaven is. Everybody will, u- will be using his own rational reasoning to come up to some form of what paradise may look like or heaven based on his own or her own experiences. So what Islam says, no one has the right to talk about what heaven is or what it is not unless you have evidence. So what is the evidence that there is heaven. What is the evidence that, what does it look like? What is in heaven? And so in the Islamic worldview, the Islamic scripture uh, provides ample evidence as to what is heaven, who or what type of life will be in heaven, and what type of enjoyments, if you like, they will be in heaven. And once people are in heaven, Tony, no, they will not come out of heaven. And heaven, the important thing about heaven is that it's the man- manifestation of God's mercy, God's compassion. And we must not limit the idea that it's only those who believe, for instance, it's not only a Muslim in this instance who may enter heaven, but the Islamic worldview says anyone who believed in any of the prophets and the messengers that God sent to humanity, and there would be, according to the Islamic narrative, 124,000 prophets and messengers the, uh, the first people of this country may have received a prophet, and we would have no problem in believing that. 
So, so anyway. briefly, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there just to go back to, yeah. the, to the original part. What happens in heaven? I mean, uh, do people exist as personalities? Is, are there rivers, lakes, Absolute. you know, all that in, in the Islamic heaven? What is there? Uh, yes, it's a, the unanimous view of Muslim scholars is that people will live a physical life. They will be totally pure. There will be no uh, impurities in their thoughts or in their lives. There will be no backbiting and no slandering, no enmity, no animosity and there will be the rivers and houses and there will be fruits and so on. Will there be it's Christians and Jews there? Those who followed what the Islamic narrative says, any Christian who followed the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and any Jew who followed the teachings of Moses, peace be upon him, as sent to Moses and Jesus, they will be in heaven. And they'll all get on. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, they, that's yeah. the, that's but Joshua the and I, yes. we're, we're gone. That's Deborah, the, Deborah, 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 that's the beauty. Just, yeah. did you, even, did, you must have grown up with a view of heaven, Deborah. No. Oh, you didn't? No, not. I seriously didn't. Oh, not in your household, you didn't? Think no. It was a secular household? Yeah, it was a secular household. We, uh, heaven was never really mentioned. Heaven was like, oh, you know, chocolate truffles. With, uh, <laughs> yeah. Chocolate and si dark chocolate truffles. That's heaven. My yeah. concept uh, of heaven has I'm, always been a lot more fun than what you guys described. Yeah. Uh, and what could be more fun than perfect love, Josh? Oh, forever. It sounds exhausting. <laughs> 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 Okay, look, I think we're probably not going to get to the bottom of heaven tonight, but <laughs> we have another question. It's from Arthur Escamilla. My question is for Archbishop Coleridge. Yeah. Would, would you agree there is a push to uproot Judeo-Christian values from our society and to silence religion in the public square? And if you do, what do you think is the cause of it? I think in the Western world there is at the moment a certain tendency to regard Christians as the enemy. Sometimes Christians can be their own worst enemy and can provoke that kind of reaction, but not all the time. Uh, a recently coined word is, is Christianophobia. Uh, I think that goes a bit over the top. But I think that, uh, that Christianity is a threat to secularist ideology and secularist ide ideology has gained momentum so that... Um, but any, any ideology in the end will find not just Christianity, but I have to say biblical religion, seriously inimical. In other words, the enemy. So I, I think that, uh, that, that there, there has certainly evidence around the world, not just in the Western world, but around the world is that Christians are being persecuted at a greater rate now than they have been for a very, very long time. It's one of the, the facts that we don't uh, focus on too well in a place like Australia. So I think there is cause for concern. I don't think there's cause for panic, uh, but it's, it's one of the things the new Pope has talked about, the, the, the level of persecution. In the Western world, it's not so much overt, but there is a tendency to exclude not just Christianity, but religion from the public square. And that's what I mean when I talk about secularist ideology. Now, certainly, the form of Christianity that I know best, the Catholic form, will not be pushed into some churchy little corner that, that uh, we're not a political party, but we are uh, certainly intent upon engaging uh, the public realm so that there will be uh, a, a real resistance to that kind of pressure. Uh, but the pressure, I think, comes from a, a secularist ideology, which in its own funny way can be totalitarian. And any totalitarian ideology, whether it be explicitly so or implicitly so, will always find Christianity, and I would say biblical religion, seriously inimical. Okay, Josh Thomas, are you trying to uproot uh, Judeo-Christian <laughs> values? Not you, Josh. No, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think... I mean, I I've oft, would often challenge the Catholic Church and the Christian Church because you guys have made some pretty odd choices. Um, and I, I, but I... Uh, <laughs> I don't... I, I love that we live in a country where we have freedom of religion. I love that you, you can believe whatever you want to believe and you, you have the right to go to church and I would fight for that. But as soon as you start lobbying the government to have your religion impede on my life, then yeah, people are gonna get angry because... <laughs> it is annoying. Um, so I, I, I 
you know, yeah, that's, that's my place. I'm done. Okay. Uh, Rabina, I'd like to hear from you. I mean, you've jettisoned Judeo-Christian values to Eastern values, is that right? Or have you no, kept Judeo-Christian values no, along with it? This is what I meant before, and it's really nice to have all these discussions about is there heaven or not. Mm. But my, my feeling is almost that this is sort of private business, and I'd rather not talk about those things. I think it's a bit embarrassing. I mean, I don't mean that, but in, for me, I'd much rather talk about the Dalai Lama's coming in June, right? And his big deal at the moment is beyond religion, which is not meant to be rip out religion, but to try and find the common ground. And I think if you found a good Muslim, a good Jew, a good gay atheist comedian, you know, a good Catholic archbishop, and a good Buddhist and a good communist, they're all going to have moral, fundamental good ethics. And I think that's the common ground. So we can keep our religion private, you know. I think it's really important. Okay, I've got to wear these 14th century robes. What can I do? But, you know, mor what does that mean? It means fundamental goodness, not lying, not stealing, not killing, don't cheat on your partners, and, pra you know, practice kindness and, I mean, it sounds kind of cute, but it's the most intense job we'll ever do. Let's, let's go, let's go back to our out. questioner, um, uh, Arthur. Uh... <laughs> okay, Arthur Escamilla, who asked the question. Now, you're listening to this. I think you're a Christian yourself. I, I mean, do you, do you find, what do you find threatening? Well, I find that, as the Archbishop pointed out, there is a push to take away from society many of the structures that have made, have created these world we live in and these structures of charity, of concern for others are rooted in Judeo-Christian principles. I don't know how many atheists are setting up orphanages around the world. Oh, okay, wow. let's see, Deborah Conway. It's, it's well, rooted in good humanity. Yeah. Christians happen to also agree with humanity. They uh, didn't create it. Uh, Buddha uh, didn't create it either. I, do, I, th I think you've got a point in the sense that I think at the moment what's happening is that the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I think there is so much animosity and anger towards the church. Uh, I think, you know, largely to do with um, the terrible um, suffering that numbers of people have, have now admitted to with... Uh, Pedophile priests, and, and of course, and I would, and I would actually point out that that um, pedophilia doesn't exist in the church alone. I mean, there's numbers of institutions, and 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 numbers of them not having any religious religion in basis that uh, that that's happened in. But I think there is an enormous amount of anger that has been directed at the church because of um, the way that they've dealt with those things, and and and. And in a sense, you know, what's happening is that we've just decided that, you know, it's all bad and let's get rid of the whole lot. And I think that's that's a terrible mistake, really, because it, it does actually offer a lot of, com you know, speaking as an atheist, it does actually offer a lot of comfort for a lot of people. And, yeah, there's been... a. a huge amount of, of good things that have been set up in the name of whatever uh, religious institution. That's not to say that atheists don't do it. You know, you know, Medicine Sans Frontières sure. is, a, is a wonderful organisation right. that I don't oh. believe yeah. has any... Yeah. One of my favourite charities. But, uh, but I, I do think that there is um, real issues that have to be confronted uh, um, within the church, and I think that they, they are starting to do that now. And I think there is a danger that um, that everybody has turned far too aggressively against a much a wider issue than than what actually exists. Mm -hmm. uh, Mohammed, um, uh, look, I don't know whether Judeo-Christian values are totally compatible with Islam, or there, there are crossovers. Obviously, um, do you feel a kind of pushback from the community against religion? First, there are, of course, many commonalities between Islam and Judeo-Christian uh, moral, ethical, spiritual values and teachings, and very much a lot of commonalities, in fact, with Buddhism, when, it, when you talk about mysticism and spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, many people are unaware of. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the unfortunate nature, perhaps, of secular modern societies that religion does not necessarily play a role in their lives. Uh, and that doesn't mean that religions do not have core values, as, as Deborah has mentioned. There are core values in all faith traditions and all religions. And in every time, in every place, in every society, these core values are necessary for the enhancement of our humanity. You don't have to be a Muslim and you don't have to be a Jew or a Buddhist or a Christian right. to have these innate good nature exactly. and to have these wonderful human values that can mm. enhance our societies. Mm. So the concentration should not be on whether a particular faith tradition or religion, but rather to examine the commonalities, the human mm. 
essence that is in all of us sure. to enhance our society, That's a right. secular modern society that wherein one religion cannot dominate and will not dominate and must not dominate. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're uh, watching Q&A, trying to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so watching Q&A, no matter what you believe. Uh, next question comes from Simon Lenton. Uh, my question is for Mark Colwood. I can never see you. Stand up when you say the question. Oh, say, sure. It's really <laughs> nice to see who you are. I didn't sign up for Hello, this. Hello, Simon. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this question is for Mark Coleridge. Um, it's a three-part question, so bear with me. How does the church... I hope I can remember all three. <laughs> I'll remind you if you don't, don't worry. Um, how does the church in good conscience uphold the discipline of clerical celibacy when there is and has been widespread sexual abuse by the clergy and subsequent cover-ups by the church? Does the church perceive that the benefits of celibacy continue to outweigh the detriment to society uh, and the church caused by the abuses? And finally, how does the church justify such a discipline when the Bible says that God himself states immediately after creating man, i.e. Adam, he declared that it is not good for man to be alone? Yeah, well, celibacy doesn't mean you're alone. It's not the same just as abstinence. I'm a celibate and I regard my celibacy as, as, as genuinely a way of loving as is married love or friendship. So it's, it's, not, it's not saying no to sexuality. It's a different way of living sexuality. Now, that sounds strange, but that's the reality. Now... It is saying no to sexuality, though, Well, it's, it? it's personal it's sexuality. It's saying no to sexual activity. Yeah. But I still live my sexuality. I don't just put it on the shelf. Mm. How do you live it? I mean, it's quite... <laughs> <laughs> I live it as a way of self-giving. Right. In all kinds of... <laughs> I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if you're talking about what goes on behind closed doors. No, I'm not. Ta I'm talking about what goes on in the goldfish bowl that I inhabit as a Catholic bishop. All right. A pouring out of one's life, a giving, a self-giving, a kind of a, a, a living from day to day. But seriously, I've, I've never heard an archbishop describe that as a sexual feeling. Mm. It involves, see, sexuality is more than sexual activity. Mm. Every cell of my body is male and I have to live that from day to day. So I come back to the point that as, as I experience it and have now for many years, celibate living is not an abandonment of sexuality or a rejection. It's simply a way of living my life differently. Okay, and my sexuality. I'm going to bring you to the, yep, the, core, the, question, of the yep. core of the question. Really, is a lot of people have made the case that celibacy yeah. creates a kind of sexual deviancy yeah, in well, some individuals within the church. Sure, I, I, and that's I, led to the scandals and the sexual abuse of children and so on. Yeah, I, I'm not convinced, and I think many are not convinced, that the celibacy is a major factor in the whole business of sexual abuse. Far and away, the, 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 the major proportion of those who abuse kids are in fact married people. That's uh, right. Not celibate people. That's right. Now, uh, that having been said, I, I, I don't think uh, celibacy... It, it could contribute to a certain... creating a certain culture that, that makes uh, sexual deviance more possible. But I don't think you can trace a direct link from celibacy... To, to sexual abuse. Mm. Now, why retain it? And it, 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 look, it could be revised mm. at some future date. I don't know. I didn't bring my crystal ball with me. But, but it, it goes back to Jesus. I mean, Jesus wasn't married. That was a very mysterious and unusual thing in a Jew of that time. Uh, so, so but you can't say that he was celibate. Well, I would, in fact, yes. Mm. The majority of his followers were. Married. That's true, that's true. We, we, well, that, given the little we know about them, yeah, they were. But, but the, I think the judgment has been made in the church, rightly or wrongly, I happen to think rightly, that celibacy in fact, although it's lived poorly by some and perhaps by many, is also lived very well by, by others and by many and becomes an extraordinary source of um, spiritual fruitfulness and pastoral fruitfulness. In other words, it unleashes energies in a, in, a, in a human being. And this is perceived not only within Christianity, but dare I say in Rabina's presence, also within Buddhism, Buddhism and other religious traditions. So that, that at, at, to this point historically, the, the Catholic Church has made the judgment that the pros outweigh the cons. You know, so what, the, my question, so I think there's an important question here. Right? So you're saying it's not celibacy, because we're, this has been going on a lot, right? What? 
what? pedophilia in the Catholic Church in every <laughs> country Look, for a very long time. And we're not talking about, like, I, th I think it's important when we talk about sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. I, I didn't realize until recently we're talking about rape. We're talking about raping kids. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people watching this thing we're talking about, like, uh, I can assure you I know it. Yeah, a lot of people don't though. And we're talking about rape and it's happening in Australia, it's happening in a lot of countries, it's happening for a long time, and it's happening a lot more in the Catholic Church. And no, the response... see, that, that last statement I would dispute. It's happening at about the same rate, I would say, but it's worse because Catholic priests have unusual access to the young, mm. and an exceptional mm. degree of trust is placed in the Catholic yeah. priest. And you also so have a the tradition the... of covering it up. I mean... Well, we do. Who's we? The, the Catholic yeah. Church has a tradition of covering up. And yeah, the but, but Josh, that I've Josh read... if I could just say, is it only, or ask, is it only the Catholic Church that has been covering up? I don't deny what you're saying. Well, I don't know. I'm talking to you. You're the Catholic okay, Church. Okay. If they were here, I'd be hassling them. Okay. Uh, well, keep hassling them. So the... <laughs> Their response has been that the, with these two programs that they have to sort of apologise and give money often. But I just think the Catholic oh. Church needs to sit down and they need to question why so many people in their institution think this is an appropriate way to spend their time. So if it's not celibacy, my question is yeah. what do you think needs to change? Because it's a question that I haven't heard a lot of Catholics ask. Well, I can assure you that mm. I and many others have been grappling with this for at least 25 years. Yeah. Asking how, well, first of all, when it appeared on my radar screen in about 1985, I would have said, uh, it, I, I couldn't believe it. I just thought it was absolutely impossible. And, and then uh, one thing after another followed and I, I began to see the scale of it and not just in my own church either. Uh, and then another stage in my own journey of discovery was uh, to see that there, 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 there were cultural factors conspiring in all of this. It wasn't yeah. just individuals. There was something cultural. It took me years to see this, I have to say. Why, why did it take so long for the church to stop shifting around pedophile priests to different yeah. areas well, to take them away from yeah. where they're abusing and put them somewhere else no, where, uh, they, where they were unseen by the people that abuse them? Absolutely. And then they go on to abuse another group. No, I, I, that, that, that is a crucial question. The answer in brief is that the, the, the perception was, and it was sometimes based upon clinical advice, uh, that, that it was a kind of a moral problem. And with the right kind of uh, admonition and spiritual discipline and a fresh start, that the whole thing... In other words, the understanding of the pathology was pathetic. And the understanding of, of, of how to address the pathology was uh, equally it, pathetic. It, isn't, it, isn't it about, like, isn't it, isn't it sort of equitable to um, arsonists who join the fire brigade? I mean, we're not talking about, I, I would have thought we're not talking about Catholicism corrupting the minds of, of priests who then become pedophiles. I would say that people who, um, who have those inclinations uh, see the Catholic Church or any church or institutions where you work closely with children or Boy Scouts, at, or Boy Scouts as an opportunity to be able to yeah. uh, explore their sexual deviancy yeah. or you know and and by and large the Catholic Church have been completely inadequate about dealing yeah. with it I agree. but I would I'd, I can't imagine that Catholicism itself or I mean as as you said I think earlier um, the, the the act of um, of uh, of, of children being abused, it doesn't. It doesn't. Ex it exists with married couples as well. I mean, it's not. It's not about taking. So, do you think that's so right, though? That general principle that, that, that people joined the priesthood to abuse. I think no. It because wasn't that, that would give them the opportunities. No. No. I, I don't think it worked at that conscious level. I think that there were people in whom there were, as it were, latent pedophile impulses who were drawn to the priesthood, and those impulses only emerged from latency later on. Because some of those who have been uh, appalling abusers in the clergy, there was no hint of it in their seminary training or their early years of the priesthood. So, 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 so I, I right. think there were, it was working at some deep unconscious level and was hidden in that sense too. So very briefly, mm. because you said it was seen as a moral issue when in yeah. fact it was a criminal issue. Criminal so issue. Was it actually criminal to treat it as a moral issue? Well, that's one possible line of argument. I don't know the answer to it. Okay, right. so, um, we've got quite a lot of different questions yeah. to get through uh, tonight. Uh, next one, I'm going to move on. The next one comes from India O'Neill. Where are you? Where is she? India, Just yep. Just at the back here. Go ahead. 
Uh, Time magazine world editor Bobby Ghosh famously stated that Osama bin Laden's greatest legacy was redefining the word jihad from an internal struggle against vice to an external struggle against forces that would threaten the faith, which might involve taking up arms. How can Muslims reclaim the original definition of jihad and how can the perception of Islam amongst Muslims and non-Muslims alike be returned to the focus on ethics, love and peace? Mohammed, thank you so much for that very important question. Yes, it is true, unfortunately, that jihad or the word jihad has been misunderstood, misinterpreted and indeed hijacked for various ulterior motives, political uh, reasons. The etymology of the word jihad is juhud, which, to, which means to strive and to struggle. And you, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, one of the greatest forms of jihad or struggle is the inward uh, struggle to reform one's own self, to refine one's own self, so that a person is morally and ethically uh, uh, enhanced, if you like. Unfortunately, the word jihad has been misused by people like Osama bin Laden, where it uh, implied in their mind a war against infidels or non-believers. And incidentally, it, they didn't have to be non-Muslims, but also Muslims were casualty of this misinterpretation. Uh, jihad has many meanings in, in Islam, uh, one of which is uh, to strive and struggle. As I said, a woman giving birth, for instance, is in a form of jihad. She's in a form of struggle. Uh, I sta I'm standing here in front of you trying to explain this is a form of jihad without any guns and without any swords <laughs> waging. So it's a struggle. Uh, however, I think there is a tragedy in the way Islam is being taught in institutions, in schools, and so on. And as Muslims, we need to rethink the way we are uh, teaching Islam. For the last f century or so, Islam has been taught in a very puritanical way. Islam has been taught in a very legalistic way. And we have forgotten a, a tremendous wealth of spiritual heritage, a mystical tradition that Islam has, has left us. And therefore, I think it's upon the leaders and the teachers to begin teaching their communities, the Islamic communities, about that wonderful, mystical, spiritual heritage that is intended to reform the, in, the inward of a human being and not only the external observances. Mohammed, can, can I interrupt you there? Because you talk about the, the teaching and how the yes. teaching has been wrong. And part of the distortion of the idea of jihad, jihad um, has included radical imams offering uh, and this again is a sort of sexual perversion, Absolutely. it seems, but mm. offering to young men the prospect of 72 virgins mm. uh, in Such heaven, a specific number, too. in heaven, yeah. if they <laughs> if they become a martyr and yes. die in the process of, for example, a suicide bombing. How mm. did it get to that point? First, the this number of 70 versions is somewhat concocted. I don't know how it came from. You know, to be specific about it is. It rather, came from the hadith. Yeah, but uh, I mean, there is the hadith doesn't speci specify 70. There are 72. many a hadith. Well, not 72, actually, it doesn't. There, is, mm. there are uh, various traditions. And that is a problem in Western discourse, not looking at the context when we talk about Islam or Islamic issues. The idea that a person can commit suicide and therefore go to heaven is in itself a self-contradiction because Islam prohibits suicide. So a person who actually commits suicide According to the majority of scholars, the unanimous opinion of scholars, this is a person who has committed an act, a criminal act, for which he's not entitled to heaven. It is a person, this is a person who will be punished, and under Islamic law, it's a crime against humanity. And so the idea that a person kills innocent people and therefore achieves the mercy of God in the manifestation of going to heaven is is a fallacy. It is a, a delusion in the minds of these people. And, How, and offered up, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, yeah. it does seem in some major religions, um, at least in the in branches of them, there is a perversion of sexuality. And in this case, it's aimed at young men Absolutely. coming from repressed 
uh, sexual backgrounds and it's offering up something that they would otherwise never find? Well, well I, I don't think so. That is not the only reason. I think there are a host of reasons. We must never uh, uh, point at one cause, at one single faceted cause as to why these people commit acts of criminal acts of suicide. Uh, to assume that it is poverty or to assume it is because they want to enter heaven, this is rather too simplistic. Re abundant research tells us there are socio-economic political reasons as to why people become vulnerable and they are engulfed in this uh, ridiculous understanding of the faith, socioeconomic reasons. There is a host of, of research out there, marginalization, racism against these people that pushes them out of mainstream society, that makes them more vulnerable. The idea that they don't feel belonging, say, to a, a place like Australia, a person who's grown up all of his life here and loses his sense of belonging and becomes more vulnerable but to the these teachers, But the teachers that you say are perverting the faith, uh, they're not vulnerable, they're just absolutely, manipulating yes. these 100%, people. A hundred percent, they're manipulators, they take the text out of, out of context. Mm. Uh, because you have to look at the text and the context. And to use even the term Islamic terrorism or Islamic extremism in itself is, con is, is a self-contradiction. There are Muslim extremists, definitely. There are Muslim terrorists, definitely. But Islam as a faith itself is 100% against the fo any form of extremism, even sexual extremism. That is why in Islam, sexuality is recognized. It's an innate nature of human beings that must be expressed in a lawful way, but it should be controlled. Otherwise, any other form of manifestation can lead to extremism. Okay, I'm, I'm going to bring in Deborah Conway yeah. here. I'd like to get your perspective on what we're hearing. As a, this is a type of Islam which most people would be very comfortable with. I'm very comfortable with it already. But it's not, um, it certainly doesn't fit with, um, with what I've been um, accustomed to and since, uh, since those um, bombers went into the, the World Trade Centre on 9-11. It is, it is really refreshing to hear you talk that way and I, I suppose I wish that, um, that more Muslim leaders had come out and talked more openly and, and more um, vigorously uh, by, by criticising the, the, the proponents but of, they of have, people. But they have, but not people don't, are not listening. I, I, would, I, would, I would have liked they to have, have seen, I would have liked to have seen. There, there has been... There has been so many fatwas, legal opinions, issued against terrorism. And I get asked this question again and again, why don't Muslim leaders speak? They have spoken. The fact that you didn't hear about it is perhaps your, the, the problem of the media. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, that's maybe that's there are, maybe. Yeah. Is it, is it also possibly true, very briefly, because yeah. we have to move to other questions, but it's also possibly true that in places where you get the flashpoints, like Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, those voices are mute. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, they're moderate voices. Most certainly. You know, it's often the majority are silent, those who are opposed. And that is another problem. Whilst there are leaders uh, who speak against, of course, you know, they speak. Uh, it's always the silent majority. It doesn't help when, you know, when, you, when there's, when there's um, demonstrations on the street and they carry signs that say, you know, um, infidels should be beheaded. It would have been terrific if, if the Muslim community had come out and marched. I think that would have been, that would have been a wonderful mm -hmm. thing and, and people would have applauded loudly. Uh, yes, if yeah. that had happened, you know, against this kind of extremism. I mean, extremist mm. anything is, is, is... A very um, brief response to that and we'll move on to our next question. Absolutely. Grateful. I think uh, the Muslim community in its, uh, has in, in a, a number of ways also failed to come out openly and condemn acts of terrorism. Yes, there has been condemnation, but I think there could be more of it. The, major, major, the majority, the silent majority needs to come out. And we began to see this happening uh, recently in Australia. I think you have to understand also the community was under shock. Sometimes you're damned if you respond and you're damned if you don't respond. As in the case of Dr. Muhammad Hanif, if you recall. We were in a real dilemma. If you respond, you're damned. And if you don't respond, you're damned. Muhammad Hanif, if you recall the, the story yes. of Muhammad yes. Hanif. But what we are beginning to see in Australia, there is a sense of maturity among the Australian Muslim community. There is a sense of maturity and it's, it's heartening to see that. It's a, a good, positive uh, uh, improvement. The latest violent protests that took place in Sydney uh, as a consequence of the film that was made against the Prophet Muhammad, 
it was met with wide condemnation from the Islamic yes. leaders mm. and the community, okay. yes, which right. was well, fantastic. We'll leave that point there. You're watching Q&A. Our next question is a video. It comes from uh, Mohammed El Lacy in mm. Melbourne. As a youth worker in the Islamic community, I'm in constant contact with young Muslims struggling with same-sex attraction. Many of them are also dealing with chronic depression as they struggle with a sexual orientation that they have no choice over and the prospect of losing their family and community if outed. I've spoken to many imams, rabbis and priests on this issue and the answer that always comes back is that these people should either remain celibate or, if appropriate, get married to somebody of the opposite sex. Both of these solutions I feel are unrealistic and sustainable in the long term. So my question uh, is this, and especially to the uh, Honourable Archbishop and the respected Imam. Do you feel that this issue has become the Achilles heel of our faiths as we struggle to provide sensible and realistic solutions, especially in this postmodern world? Uh, let's start with uh, Mark Coleridge. Yeah, well, I... Uh... <laughs> I don't think for a moment it's become our Achilles heel, but I think we are faced with a conundrum. And if I could put it as briefly as possible, uh, gay people have as much right to, to justice as anyone else in the community. I state the obvious there. Uh, at the same time, uh, and therefore, these people, whether they be Muslim or whatever, young people particularly who are, as, as, as the questioner said, struggling with same-sex attraction, they need every kind of support, help, accompaniment. You mean, do you mean so they can get over it? <clears throat> No, I don't necessarily mean that at all. They might have to live with... I mean, the, the phenomenon of same-sex attraction can mean all kinds of different things. It's not a single rubric, it seems to me. That, that uh, sometimes it's a developmental thing, it is a phase. Other times it seems to be something that's permanent and more deeply rooted. Who knows? It, it's a mysterious thing. Human sexuality always is. So certainly young people need all the support that Muhammad and those like him can provide. But what, what the church has to do is to, to remain faithful to our understanding of homosexuality and yet at the same time to, to work in every way we can to ensure justice for homosexual people. Now clearly this doesn't mean to say for instance that we, we support gay marriage. The church's position on that <coughs> is, is very well known and, and controversial. But, uh, but in every other way uh, to, to work to defend the dignity of homosexual people just as we work to defend the dignity of other people. How to, do, how, how to do that and to maintain fidelity to our understanding of, of homosexuality which is grounded upon a particular vision of the, what the human person is and what human sexuality is within, within that context. How to hold those two things together is the conundrum that we are, we are dealing with. I don't think it's an Achilles heel, but I think it is a real conundrum with which the church has to continue to grapple at this right, time. Josh is dying culture. to get in here, but I want to hear from, <laughs> I want to hear from Rabina first. So the question is? Well, <laughs> the question was really about how... Is it, good, is it, is it okay to be will, gay? How, well, how okay. both the Catholic well, think, church in okay. this case and the Islamic faith are dealing... Well, I've no idea about that. ..with people who are but, struggling with homosexuality. Yeah, I don't know about that. But I feel my, my answer to this would be is, I mean, if I look into the Buddhist texts, there are probably just as many uh, restrictions in some way in relation to sexual life, but bring it down to earth in a most practical way and being realistic, mm. human beings are human beings, and if we practise morality and compassion and forgiveness and have good relationships with each other and practise generosity and live good lives, that's the point. And the other point for, for Buddhism, because there's no concept... You know, the, of course, in, I, I, know, I was taught as a Catholic that God made us all and, and, and you need to have sex with within the sacrament of marriage. Well, there's no concept like that. Sure. For example, among Tibetan Buddhist, Tibetan people who are totally, you're fairly moral, good people, they have partners and they sometimes have two husbands and two wives because it's convenient, you know. But th there's, no con there's no concept of living with someone forever. It's not called a sacrament. As long as you are a moral, good person and you have honesty with each other and don't cheat and be mean, then, you know, have a good relationship. Nothing wrong with this. Be a big, good person. That's the point. OK, Josh. I wasn't, I wasn't dying to get in. I was, yeah. I was okay. terrified. Um, <laughs> well, you're in now, Josh. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. If you're a gay and Christian, it, to me, it just seems like you're playing a constant game of stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. And no, I, but there are plenty I, of gay Christians who yeah, aren't doing that. But I, I, that's not for me. From my yeah, okay. point of view, I just think the 
churches really overhype what the texts say about homosexuals. There's not that many texts. There's about no, five, no. I think. Yeah, They're yeah. all quite weird. Um, oh, hang I on. read them the Peter, week. you read them. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's I'll, pretty I'll, odd. I'll talk, um, I'll talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty weird. Um, uh, I, the, How do you read the ones, for example, that say homosexuals should be stoned to death? No, I don't take those ones at all at face value. So you pick and I choose which ones you... Peter, no, no. In other words, the Bible only lives by interpretation. Here I'm sounding like yeah. a rabbi, Deborah. Mm -hmm. But in other words, the text itself is dead. It only lives by interpretation and it has to be interpreted again and again and again and again and from culture to culture. And this is my so, point. I yeah, think okay. that you, the interpretation at the moment is really heavily against gays and the text isn't. I mean, we've got, I mean, there was a study done last year that the Australian Christian Lobby sent out five times as many press releases about gays than they did about any other issue. The next issue down was human trafficking. It seems to me there are two issues, though. One is, I, I mean, if you do have the view of creator and you do have the view that God made us this way and the men and women have this mutual relationship, which looks fairly evident, yeah. you know, in the simple way of talking, and then it's done in, the con in, in this, in this uh, sacrament, I would accept that's fine so that you can't argue with that. I think the problem no. is the fanaticism and the hate and the anger yeah. and the panic and, and the fear the, and the and drama. I'm not justifying that's any of that. That's, for me, the issue. Okay. I don't let's, have let's, go right, let's go right across to the other mm. side of the panel because the, that... The question really Absolutely. started with talking about young Muslim uh, gay people who mm. are struggling uh, because of how they're being treated within their religion. Um, mm. Can you tell us um, how they should be treated? Well, thank you for that question. And I think when we discuss these issues, we have to be very genuine about the perspective of a particular faith. In the Islamic faith, the question of homosexuality is very explicit and very clear. So there's two dimensions to this issue. One is what does the faith say about homosexuality? And, and briefly, what does Very it say? Very briefly. It, it prohibits it. It doesn't allow it. Mm. The second thing is what attitude should we have towards people who choose that lifestyle? Should we become, uh, uh, should we lose our compassion? Not at all. We have to have compassion towards people. It is prohibited by the unanimous agreement of Muslim scholars. But it's prohibited for those who have accepted Islam as a faith. Those who are not Muslims, Islam says nothing about them. You want to choose homosexuality, that is your choice. But for those but who... People, but the people who are in pain that he's talking about in that mm, question I'm are Muslim. Muslims. Yes, that's correct. And so, and so is there a better way to deal with this well, than so excluding them from I, the religion? Precisely. What we have to understand is that a homosexu homosexuality is seen as a sin. It does not take a person out of the fold. So he doesn't become out of the fold of Islam. It's like, in the Islamic tradition, it's very much like uh, alcoholism, if you like. And so people like this should not be seen as outside of the fold. The compassion should be shown towards them. But the culture, we have, many Muslims have grown up in cultures that does not tolerate that behavior. And so we have to have a compassionate approach. We have to approach them. So do you have to change their view now that they're living here? in Australia? Well, you, you can't change anyone's view in this country. You know, people choose their own views, but mm. you can try to interact with them. You can try to okay. be compassionate towards them. And if they, the, the truth of the matter, it will remain very difficult for their, for their families to accept that lifestyle. Okay, I'm just, we've got a couple of people with their hands up there. We'll quickly go to the gentleman right up the back there. If you've got a brief comment, that'd be great, because we're nearly out of time. Sure, it, it is quite brief. Um, my statement is to the uh, Archbishop. You can accept uh, evolution yep. uh, and, uh, uh, and creationism, and yet you can't accept homosexuality as a kind of a, um, a lifestyle, if you will. I'm going to avoid uh, the use of the word choice because it really isn't one. No, I understand um, that. And, and, and my second point, uh, 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 you touched briefly about marriage. We're talking about a socio-legal thing here. I'm not asking for you to ordain over my marriage, for example, but why should your yeah. beliefs impact on my ability to be perhaps uh, taken in front of a, a justice and for them to preside over my marriage. Yeah, well, just... <laughs> yes, uh, um, just a, a first point I'd say is uh, I distinguish completely between sexual orientation and lifestyle. They're not necessarily the same thing. Lifestyle is chosen, sexual or orientation is not. That's an important distinction. Second, so, uh, sorry, can we just confirm what you're saying there. So if it's not chosen, that means God has created it. No, not necessarily at all. It can be a, it, it, can, it, can, be, it can be a warp in the creation, to use that rather unfortunate expression. So it, I, it couldn't just be part of God's plan? No, I, I, that, that's is not... That, is that impossible from your point of view? It is impossible from my point of view, yeah, yeah. What, what I... Uh, 
So, well, I've got to hear Josh on this. Uh, okay. You, I mean, you, you... <laughs> Well, obviously, I, mean, if... I don't think I'm a warping God's plan. Obviously, I reject the. Uh, the I reject that. I, I, but, but what he's saying is, right? Marriage in our country is not a religious institution. We're talking about changing the law. Yep. So you can understand when this man says, "Why are we fighting yeah. against religion in the square?" Why people get a bit annoyed when you challenge our us wanting to change the law, which is completely irrelevant to your life. It is yeah. completely irrelevant no, to it's everything not. you See, do. Josh, it's not irrelevant to my life because it's not irrelevant to the, the basic functioning of society as a whole. It's not irrelevant to the common good. What we... What common good? <laughs> what is happening? When I, because I, I, when I, I kiss my boyfriend would... goodnight and I tell my okay. boyfriend that I love him and he says, I love you too, and we fall asleep hugging each okay. other, what about that is hurting you? No, nothing... I don't understand. Nothing is hurting me personally. <laughs> But marriage, marriage is not just between two individuals. But surely, it but is, in fact, something that goes to the heart of what makes for human flourishing in any society. That's been the wisdom well, of the ages. And the wisdom of the ages, in my view, <laughs> has something to contribute to shaping the common good. Therefore, we will continue to speak with our voice and other voices are welcome to contribute. I think um, that's... I say... It's been a great discussion. I see that a number of people have their hands up, but I'm afraid we're out of time. In fact, we've just gone over time. So please thank our panel, Mohammed, Mohammed Abdallah, Deborah Conway, Josh Thomas, Mark Coleridge, and Rabina Corton. And Deborah, that's your cue. Thank you. And join us next week for another special Q&A, our very first all women panel with indigenous opera singer, composer and impresario Deborah Cheatham. Uh, research scientist Brooke McNanty, who funded her university studies by working in London as a call girl and published her memoirs as Belle de Jour. Author and historian Germaine Greer, whose book The Female Eunuch helped launch modern feminism. Mia Friedman, the founder of the influential women's website Mamma Mia and outspoken critic of old style feminism, the Australian's columnist Janet Albrickson. Well, we'll leave you tonight with Deborah Conway and Willie Ziggers singing on the search for meaning with the Book of Life. Until next week's Q&A, good night. Everybody's empty, but it's not for food And everybody's praying here to be rescued Examining our sins, it's hard not to conclude We're screwed The world's in flames, these maddened days of black and white no shades of grey to keep at bay the darkest night There's never been a song that could save a life uh -huh. Blow the horn, blow the horn Give a voice to all the mournful souls who search to be reborn tonight Forgiveness like the sharpest knife Oh God, inscribe me in the book of life I've been hungry since before the dawn Tired and full of uncried tears I still can't shed Stored up with the unsaid things we never said You wanted forgiveness wasn't ready yet Now you're dead To all the souls who lost themselves I sing for you Apart from that There's nothing more that I can do And though I know it's useless It kind of helps me through To all the mournful souls who search to be reborn tonight Forgiveness like the sharpest knife Oh God, inscribe me in the book of life I've been hungry since before the dawn See
see my children out in the world Grown into women, fun little girls Why wouldn't you want that too? The older you get, the more friends you lose Next year I won't disappear in fire or flood Next year I'll still be here to do some good I won't be taken by pills or thrills or wine I should be doing fine Blow the horn, blow the horn Give a voice to all the mournful souls Who search to be reborn tonight Forgiveness like the sharpest knife God, describe me in the book of life I've been hungry since before the dawn I've been hungry since before